I passed out going 65 on the 101 after 16 years of sobriety. So, you know, I know where this takes me. Good to see you. Hey. Oh, your eyes are so Pleasure. beautiful. Oh, well, thank you. Yes, thank you for having me. Hi, honey. Oh my gosh, she's so cute. She's actually on a diet. She's been on a ration diet for about six months. She's much smaller. I can't even believe that I'm here with you right now. Like in living flesh, Shelly is here. It's just, it's been such a journey. And I, I'm just so happy that you came across that clip. I kept hearing that you're in this video that's going viral. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Because I'm on social media, but I do not comment because I do not trust what I'm going to say, right? So I'm, I'm a voyeur. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so somebody sent it to me, and it was just like, um, it was like this God shot. For those of you who just stumbled across this video and have never seen my episodes with Crush, let me just give you a quick little lowdown of how I came across Shelly. I interviewed Crush Jaddy, who's a dancer from a gay strip club in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and he gave this story that went so viral. I walk in, I didn't know it was a gay meeting. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. I walk in and I'm sitting, it was in LA, I was in a halfway house in LA, and I walk into this meeting, I sit down, and I'm all up because I'm sobering up and at the end of the meeting the secretary goes thank you for coming to the Friday night LGBTQ whatever all the letters are mm -hmm. meeting at Jocelyn Park and I like oh sh not supposed to be here get up and just dart for the door mm -hmm. and this huge butch lesbian is sitting by the door and her name is Shelly I'll never forget her she gets up grabs me by my chest I was only 145 pounds at the time <laughs> and throws me back in the room. And she goes, where are you going, kid? And I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm straight, I'm not supposed to be here. And she goes, we don't give a f you need to get sober. Wow. And she made me stay and get a commitment, which is like a volunteer job at the meeting. And then that group of gay men, lesbians, trans women, helped me get my life back together. I was pretty much homeless at the time, no job, nothing, I had nothing. And uh, they helped me get my life together. I learned so much from the gay community and the gay community has been through such a harder time than a lot of the straight community that I learned more how to be a man, a grown man from gay men than I ever did from any straight man I've ever met. That's power, I have chills, that's really powerful to hear. People were tweeting about it left and right with a clip and those clips were going viral and everyone was wanting to know where Shelly was. And all of a sudden I got a Facebook message. There was no picture on the Facebook message or anything, so I figured it was going to be fake, but I followed through with a message just in case. And lo and behold, it was real. I had found Shelly. I mean, it was so amazing because you just never know when something's going to happen that's going to change your life. But you know what? Someone did that to me when I first got sober. Will you tell me about that story? Yeah, absolutely. I gotta get sober because I'm dying. And this woman tells me the only thing I have to do now is accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and you don't ever have to drink again. Which is the last thing I wanted to hear at that moment in time in my life. And she said, no, you gotta find the creator on your own. And you can call it what you call the creator, you know, but it's gotta be a power greater than yourself. I have no idea who that woman was, what her name was, but she allowed me to go to that second day of wanting to stay sober. Mm. It, you know, that was the beginning of that journey, and that woman saved my life. I guess the journey of sobriety, everybody helps each other, right? And that's how you all stay, everyone stays sober. Absolutely. And I can't do it on my own. Mm. I was sober 16 years once, and I, and I picked up a drink, and it was, you know, the predictable disaster eventually happened. I passed out going 65 on the 101 after 16 years of sobriety. So, you know, I know where this takes me. And uh, I have a lot of things I want to accomplish yet on this planet. And I can't do it unless I'm, I'm fully present. <laughs> I am excited to announce that I am starting an Our Career Life newsletter. This is your backstage pass to my creative process, upcoming projects, and the stories that shape the queer community. It is completely free and you can sign up by going to the link in my bio. Thank you so much. I am so excited about this new endeavor and now back to the interview.
In the summer of 1981, we started hearing two rumors. One rumor was that there was a love drug coming to town. The other rumor going around is that there were men who were starting to get really sick very quickly and dying, and that there was an odd cancer involved, called Carposius sarcoma. And I knew statistically immediately that something was very wrong. There's a lot of anxiety. All of us that are taking care of the patients go through, go through periods of personal anxiety about, about getting the disease. We don't know what we're dealing with and we don't know how it's spread. A mystery disease known as the gay plague has become an epidemic unprecedented in the history of American medicine. This is the thing. Dozens of men were dying every week. Hundreds every month. Month after month year after year there's no test it was almost five years before we even had a test anthony fossey's sitting on half a million dollars half a billion dollars nothing nothing when things really kicked in there was the shock of the illness and how quickly i mean that was the macho air these guys and we were all so young man we were in our 20s and 30s that generation from about 30 to 45 at the time just got wiped out all right i mean wiped out and i think quite frankly most of the men had no clue i don't think any of us even knew this thing existed before most of that first wave was infected then what happened is that we've got this community and thank god we were in this tight knit Real, I mean, everywhere you went, where you worked, where you played, uh, where you lived, it, 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 was, it was all homosexuals. Mm -hmm. So many people were estranged from their family. It was awful. That was the worst part, I think. You've been involved with somebody 10, 20 years. It's your partner. Your partner gets sick, and, and the family's keeping you from going to see them. You know, you didn't have the kind of safety nets. So we literally, from the ground up, and women were very involved with this, we started gardens, feed people, we started delivering food, people were shut in, there was dogs to be walked, animals to be cared for, I mean, you name it, you name it, it was getting done. During the darkest days of the AIDS crisis in San Francisco, while many turned away, the lesbian community turned up in numbers. When fear and prejudice left countless gay men fighting AIDS without support, it was often lesbians who became the backbone of the resistance, stepping into roles as caregivers, advocates, and fierce allies in the battle for survival. These women took on the care that society and even some families refused to give. In a city brought to its knees, lesbians stood as a pillar of strength, standing for their friends and for a vision of a world where care wasn't contingent on acceptance. One day, in the mid 80s, I'm walking down the a market for a friend, meet me here. So I go down and meet, and, meet, and I walk into the storefront. They had just started the quilt. The quilt project. They've got this room and they've got these cubby holes so everybody could roll up their quilt and put it in there and when they weren't working on it. They had these big tables laid out. They had little areas so you could put your little trinkets and store them there. They had just set up the office for the quilt project. Everybody was involved. Everybody, every, nobody, nobody said, I'm done with this, I'm retreating. When you're in that kind of a situation, you see something in front of you needs to be done, you do it. And if that's an interest of yours, you get some of your friends who might be interested and you do it. It was so ad hoc and so organic from the ground up. You saw a need and you got involved. It's, it moves me so much to hear those words because I think nowadays there is so much division with our, within our own community, you know, lesbians and gay people and tran transgender people, and there's a lot of division and, and to hear of those times when there's a crisis and everyone joined together to help us. We gotta stop this. Look at I gave up my judgment card in life when I drank again, all right? I don't have any interest in judging anybody. This was a community that was successful back in the 80s because collectively we decided we are not gonna live in fear anymore. We were in a war. <laughs> we were in a war. I mean, when you walked around San Francisco, get this, San Francisco, the Castro District, almost everybody I knew had a whistle that they brought with them. And we had whistle patrols because the gay bashing 
was still pr so prevalent that you whistled and there'd be people who would volunteer. To, this is another good example. People would volunteer to go do the whistle patrol the night. You heard a whistle, everybody ran to the whistle. And, and, you, and you know, you, you, you get together, hey, you want to do a whistle crew tonight just to hang out? It was like a, it was like a party, right? <laughs> Let's do that. And you'd hear the whistle, and there you'd go, off running at toward the whistle. So when you're in that kind of a situation, you form such tight relationships with people. The circumstances, I think, drove a lot of the connectedness. So someone is here on Friday, they want to buy this one. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Wow. And they want to buy this one, but I've never been interested in selling it. It's one of my favorites, but I think I might because I like the person. I love this one. You know, it's so funny, man. The professors loved it. Everybody loves it. I have an issue with it. Why? Because unconsciously. Uh -huh. <laughs> this one looks like the only ex-girlfriend that I don't have fun memories of. <laughs> so it might and I've had a lot uh -huh. of ex-girlfriends and I have fun memories of all of them. But that one, is so I would be happy if, if he buys it. The second time, I'm drinking a fifth of scotch a day at, and whatever else was around. Uh, my mother is dying. She, we have her in home hospice. She's got five kids. All of us showed up to help at one time or another. And there's no hiding when Shelly's drinking. I mean, you can imagine this poor woman. Her most desperate fear was when I was out there driving around, wasted. And her greatest joy was that I had gotten sober and built this amazing life. I had an amazing life before I slipped. And here I am on a fifth of scotch a day. The day before she died, she wanted a private talk with each one of her kids. She was lucid, you know, that happens. So it's, it's a phenomenon. So, and I told her, I promised her that I was gonna get sober again. And I didn't know when. I, I was honest. I said, Ma, it's my, my first rodeo. I'm not ready yet. I want to be ready, but I'm not ready. And I don't know why I'm not ready, but I'm not ready. But I will be, I promise you. And uh, the next day she died. That was the last uh, coherent conversation I had with my mom. Now, can you imagine, Matt, how would I have felt if I hadn't kept that promise? I couldn't live with myself. I loved that woman. I adored that woman. Where are you at with your sobriety journey now? It's been that's been twenty years now, and um, amazing. You should be so proud of yourself. Cool. Congratulations. Well, thank you. You know, you know, I feel like I'm just getting started in life. I really do. Sobriety to me is about choosing life. I just want to live life, and Matt, that's what I've always only wanted to do. I swear to God, I think that's all we want to do. All of us, right? We had enough tearing stuff down. I, I saw enough death during AIDS. We lost at least 750,000. That's a lot of people. Life is really precious. It's really, pre it may be from my own experiences. I have looked death in the eye so many times I've lost count. And I don't want to spend it arguing with you or anybody else. I don't want to spend it attacking you or anybody else. I want to spend it that we start to heal. We've got a lot of healing to do in this community. And we're going through a whole new thing now. I I'm worried about the splits I see. This is the first time in my life that I've seen splits happening. When you say splits, you mean like segregating our community? Or... Yes, yes, yes. Our strength has always been in unity in numbers. When we are unified, we are strong. What Shelly said right there is 
exactly how I feel and her words truly moved me. We are so much stronger together and when we lift each other up, we not only honor our shared history, but we also create a world where each and every one of us can thrive. Hearing her talk about how during the AIDS epidemic, the lesbians, you know, stood beside us and fought with us and were building gardens for us and walking our dogs and being there for us bedside because maybe our families weren't during those times. It moved me so much and it made me feel so honored to have her on my show. I just feel so grateful for my series for the fact that it has educated me so much. You know, going into the series, I was not nearly as educated about our queer history as I am now. And it's felt so good to learn so much about the people before me in our community. And it makes me appreciate and feel so grateful for the life that I get to live because of that. A couple things I wanted to talk to you about. First is I am looking for another editor to join my team. So if that is you, or if you know an editor who is great that you think would vibe with my material and really resonate with what I'm trying to do, and if you edit with Final Cut Pro, that would be amazing because that's what I use. So to be able to have the workflow between us is, is, is essential for what I'm trying to do. Please email me if that is you, or if you know somebody, have them email me and we can continue the conversation there. Just write me a little bit about you know, where you're from, any work you've done, what your fees are, and we can just take the conversation from there. I know I've mentioned in the past couple episodes that I am starting a newsletter, which I am so excited about. It is linked below. And I know I've also said in the past, but just want to reiterate, I'm going to Tokyo and Thailand in December. I think I'm all set for stories in Tokyo. I mean, that being said, if you live in Tokyo, you know, I can always make room if there's a story that really interests me. Um, but I have some amazing interviews set in Tokyo, but I'm still looking for Thailand stories. So if you live there or if you know somebody who does, like whether it be you follow someone on social media that you think would be a good fit, or if you actually know somebody who physically lives in Thailand, make sure to email me and let me know that too, because I've never been to Thailand. I've been wanting to go to Thailand since the inception of the series, but I need to find good stories. I'm like, Thailand is one that I'm like, Matt, you need to deliver. I think that's all. But yeah, thank you so much for watching and I will see you very, very soon. Okay, bye.